satellite data, you can go, oh, that's cool, that's pretty, let's just throw that in and then you end up with a presentation that's the size of my house. Um, so my name is Mark Higgins, I work for UMATSAT. Um, we are, uh, we're related to ESA, we started out as a little project in ESA and then became our own organisation. And as with all good families, we love each other most of the time. And sometimes there's the tone of bits of friction, which is kind of fun. What I'm going to talk to you about today is um, some of the changes we're seeing in how people utilise weather satellite data. So you met Sat, we're based in uh, Darmstadt, um, and usually when I travel around and people say, oh, you've moved from the UK to Germany, where are you? And you go, Darmstadt. <laughs> yeah, you get that. <laughs> That's the other thing you get, it's close to Frank. <laughs> there it is. Um, my role is working, I head up the training side of our organisation, so I help people uh, work out how can you use weather satellite data in the decision making processes, particularly in uh, weather forecasting. Um, our primary role is to look after a whole bunch of spacecraft that are looking at the Earth all the time and just have data down and out, down and out. this is what we do. Um, so if you want to do sexy stuff, go to ESA because they're the people who land spacecraft on comets, which is just incredible. <laughs> Um, we're... <laughs> um, but we'll get on to why we do it in a minute. So uh, this is some satellite data um, at night. There you go, there's the daytime, here it comes. So this is a very old school way of what we do. We, we look at moving clouds. So this is a, what we call a visible image. So you've got um, the light from the sun bouncing off clouds and coming back up towards the space. Lovely. Um, so this was uh, local midday. And uh, did any of you get outside at midday? Did you enjoy the rain? <laughs> yeah, sure it is. Yeah. There it all is. All that lovely rain. Interesting feature here, this gap, as the... We, we did this a lot in each other. Um, there's some mountains here. So this lot is flowing this way and it goes up. Dumps all its rain and snow here and then dries out nicely before it meets another band of cloud here. So it's why you've got this nice cloud-free gap here. And there's also um, lots in France, it's doing very nice. Don't we do we do all this? What hand waving? So this is kind of very old school meteorology, looking at clouds flowing across images. Now you notice at the beginning of that image, um, it was night. We had no information about the Earth. Um, if you happen to be running a major airport or something like that, having weather um, information only available during the day is not so helpful. You need information at night. That's okay, because we can also go oh, clouds at night. So it's three in the morning this morning. So you can see that system as it's moving over. It's developing nicely. This is the afternoon's rain just coming in. There we go. So clouds at night and also during the day. So this is just looking at the energy to the infrared spectrum. Um, so just looking at the energy that's coming up from the clouds towards the spacecraft. 24 hours a day. Lots of lovely mixed of clouds. Um, and so whether people look at those and go, ooh. And of course you can make a guess as to, okay, it's all flowing this way, it might keep going. So you can make statements about what the weather might do next. That's quite cool. That's not bad. And you can colour them in as well. So this is kind of really cool meteorological visualisation. So this is kind of a history in a way of meteorology over the last, say, 30 years. So we start getting weather satellites in 1960. Initially, it's just black and white images, initially sent by fax. So organizations like UMETSAT would fax them out to people, and you would have your fax. And if you're lucky, you would have two faxes. You'd go, where was it? Where's it going? Where was it? Where's it going? Or you might have four, one for the visible, one for the infrared. And then we start getting computers and you can colour them in. Okay. Now we're sending this stuff in Europe every five minutes. So it's quite a lot of high data flow. And so now we start to colour in. So this is just an example of that's the same infrared image. And all I've done is coloured in the very cold clouds red. Um, because we tend to worry a lot about the very, that when, you, when the top of a cloud is very cold, it's probably very high up. Um, and if it's uh, visible on this image, it's probably very thick and a thick, high up cloud, you've probably got a lot of cloud underneath it. It's probably raining or snowing or hailing or something underneath. And if you start to look at the shapes of them, particularly in the summer, you can start to see shapes in the red areas that can tell you where you've got, if you've got um, really significant thunderstorms, you can start to look at where might you have hail and really significant rain events happening. 
So this takes us up to maybe, I don't know, 2000, okay? We've basically, we're in a black and white era. We've only got um, three channels on our satellite. We can look at water vapor clouds. So we don't actually look at the clouds that you can see. We can see the, the water vapor around them, the visible and the infrared, and that's it. That's all we've got. Um, and then in 2003, we get a new spacecraft. We get more channels, more information, and we choose which ones we've got. <coughs> we are lovely. So we've got, this is looking in the, what we would call the visible. So this is just light that has bounced off clouds and come back up to the satellites in three very slightly different wavelengths. Very slightly, but well chosen different wavelengths. So if you look carefully, so if you look at Brazil, in this image and this image, it looks very slightly different. So there's a land sensitivity in this thing. If you look at the color of the cloud just up here, very slightly fainter there. Okay, so we can actually do something about those clouds. This is looking more in the infrared, and you can see this looks kind of like clouds, this looks a bit swirly, so this is the water vapor. Um, and this one is just weird, and we're not going to go there. Um, that's a particular, if any of you got physics backgrounds? Yeah, it's a couple of years private. Go and look at 3.9 micron, yeah? So if you have a look at the, the, the energy that comes from the sun, bounces off clouds and goes up towards the satellite, and the energy that just comes up from the Earth, if you look at the, the brightness temperatures of the two things, they cross over there. So you've got a combination of reflected information from the clouds and um, energy mm -hmm. um, being emitted from the Earth and getting out to the satellites. It's an incredibly confusing thing to operate. However, it's also really, really sensitive to the size of particles. Mm -hmm. So now we can start combining stuff. So, I mean, they're pretty much the same, yeah? So this is our morning image this morning. Don't mind the green. <laughs> so now, it looks a bit more like home, really, doesn't it? The green, you know, the, the green underneath. Look, I mean, the cyan obviously isn't natural. Okay, there's not a natural color. But you can start to see we're now becoming much more sensitive to the difference, say, between ocean and land, and land and cloud. Whereas previously, you had to have the um, background map on because you weren't going to be able to tell the difference between sometimes the land and the, uh, the ocean. Um, and do you remember when I showed you that, that there was a sort of faint difference? Yeah. The slight difference there, you see that cloud there? That cloud there, same cloud, very slight difference. This um, channel here is very, very sensitive to the size of particles. Um, so if you've got big particles, it tends to show you less. If you've got small particles, it tends to show you more. So when we combine those three channels, instead of these high up ice clouds, these are, with the big up, um, particles on being white, they show up cyan. And there's also, here, you've got non-moving bits of ice, that's snow, so we can monitor snow seasons. So what we're starting to do is to be able to combine imagery from different channels, um, from different places in the spectrum, and make statements about what's going on. So all we've got now on this image is we're looking at uh, light that's been reflected off the Earth, and we happen to have one channel that happens to be slightly more sensitive to the difference between water and ice, and we're exploring that. But you can still see the whole philosophy is stuck in people looking at images and watching stuff flow. Oh, by the way, did you see the aircraft on travels? <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's combine some more channels, throw some more together. Watch here, we'll see some lines of very... See these? Aircraft on travels. So that's the same image. Um, this is getting a bit busy now. And this is just taking data from all around. So we've got 12 different places in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum we're looking at. They're very well chosen, and they're chosen so we can do this. So basically, what we're doing here is red. Um, we've combined channels so that where we've got red, you can see how thick is the cloud. If it's red, it's probably thick. Um, we've got green, which tells us about the particle size. It still amazes me that from... Uh, 36,000 kilometers away, you can get some information about the size distribution at the level of, is it an ice particle or a water particle on the top of a bunch of clouds? I mean, it's over four, four by four kilometers, but that's what we're some. So if it's green, it's got very, very small particles on. If it's um, not green, it's got very big particles. Blue, 
is uh, warm, not blue, it's cold. So now you can start to look at this and you can say, okay, we've got some really thick ice cloud here, deeply extended, um, raining, raining and snowing here. These water clouds, much, much thinner water clouds. Now we're much more sensitive to this stuff. This black is this um, cirrus. Very, very thin cloud that we can now start to identify. And so what you've got going on is meteorologists are going, oh, look at this, we can see this cloud and this cloud and this cloud. And what they're starting to do is interpret the atmosphere based on um, the dynamics of the situation they're seeing. And it still amazes me we can see contrast going out as well. So what's actually going on? You see this? Yeah. You see a weather person. Um, there's a phenomena, for example, called the sea breeze. So um, in the summer, you'll be there in, in northern Germany at the beach, uh, and then clouds will start to appear. You see this? And you see weather people doing this, and they'll say, well, you've got cold air here and warm air here, and it flows and it goes up and it spreads out and it goes down. And right, we do all this. Lots of this. We love waving arms around. <laughs> um, and so we like waving our arms around so, so much we conceptualize things. <laughs> so what, what this comes down to is what we call conceptual models, because actually the atmosphere behaves in pretty pretty typical ways. You will have heard the word of a, you would have heard people talk about a front or the jet stream or a high or a low. Um, maybe even a trough or you know, certain particular phenomena or a thunderstorm. These are all different kinds of weather story. And so what we spend a lot of time doing is relating the weather phenomena that you can see on a satellite image to a weather story. And that's how we teach all, um, people in the weather trade how to use the satellite data because we're, we're really concentrating on these weather stories. And you will have seen some of them as well. Uh, this is today's weather story, taken off the uh, local weather service website. Okay, so some of you, this stuff will be meaningful, a big thick line with kind of spiky bits sticking up. Yeah? And you might, at the minimum, you might associate that with rain. Okay, and that might tell you something as well. So this is a, a weather forecaster who's looked at what's going on right now, and they're developing weather stories, and the underlying lines are pressure, so you've got uh, clouds in different places. You can see where the rain is. And they've basically written down their weather story using this way. This is the equivalent happening in the UK. It's a slightly different proje projection. Um, so you've got Germany here, Italy coming out. So it's just ahead of it. You can see it's telling roughly the same story, which is good. <laughs> you should do. <laughs> it gets different if you're doing forecasts out to 10 days, you know, five to 10 days, then you're allowed a bit of variety. But on the same day, you should be getting the same story. Um, which they are, okay. Um, but what's interesting on this map, there's no conceptualization of impact. So this is a forecaster telling the weather story for internal purposes. And you'll notice on here there's no satellite image. So the satellite images, where they're involved in this process, is helping people get their head in there. What is the atmosphere up to right now? And then it's conceptualized in this kind of way. This starts to, you know, it's like, okay, there's a warning of something here. It's called like fog. You know, that's sort of conceptualizing rain and making it more useful to um, public users. Yeah. Jeez. And this is the example when we start, this is us capturing these conceptual models. So this is the example of the meteorological hand waving. It's a particular model um, of what happens in uh, Latin America, where you get, we, we get quite excited, we get moisture and wind and mountains and topography interacting. And so you can generate a lot of land flows and stuff like that. Now nothing I've shown you actually has an impact on a human being yet. Yeah? And this is the bit where I think um, it took about 150 years for the weather trade to realize that nobody actually needs a weather forecast. So we started out at about 1850 with people you know, going out, having a, looking at thermometers and stuff, recording the weather, and then having a crack at forecasting tomorrow. That was pretty risky forecasting tomorrow as well. It was bad enough trying to forecast this afternoon. Um, and then we get better and better, and we start building computers and putting things to computers, and the models are getting better, and now they're getting really, really good. Um, and so in about 2000, there was quite a, 
a lot of change in the weather world where people start going, hold on, no one needs a weather forecast. What you actually need to do is make a decision of which weather is one of the factors. Now, of course, being one of the people with a tremendous heritage and history, we think our factor is the most important factor ever in anything. And of course, it's not always. Yeah? So there's now, one of the big shifts that are happening is people looking at satellite pictures is going to become, this is my prediction of the future, we're going to do less of this. A couple of reasons. One is, you can teach machines this stuff. So you can teach machines conceptual models. In fact, maybe do the conceptual machines even need the conceptual models? So you can start to develop um, stuff to do with, so this is what it looks like today. This is a forecaster looking at this. Now they will have in front of them some machine input. Okay, this is what's sitting in front of them as well as the forecaster. They're producing their forecast. Some of this will be machine integration. What's being produced much, much more now is this kind of thing. So this was the uh, DWD website this afternoon. And this was looking at, here's the rain. Okay, conceptualized entirely in terms of how will it affect someone who's actually trying to do something. Whereas all of this kind of stuff is about, ooh, look at the atmosphere, isn't it cool and lovely? Yeah. So this is very much the, the direction that we're moving in, is this is the kind of thing we're, we're supporting. And so you will see much less satellite information in the public arena, because you're going to see much more of how can we put what we know about the weather into other people's decision-making tools. Um, the military tend to be one of the more innovative areas of meteorology. They tend to have much more pressure to innovate, and they're the ones who we're starting to see do this much more, of integrating weather into their decision-making tools. Civil stuff tends to follow a little bit slower. It's an, we're, we're a very conservative trade um, in weather. We're not like uh, finance or a lot of other things. We move very, very slowly. So this is some stuff which I'm sure others of you will have experienced a lot more rather already. And the other thing is um, the machine side. So uh, one of my roles is teaching weather forecasters how to look at satellite images. I would reckon in the next 10 years, I'm going to be teaching humans how to teach machines how to look at satellite images, much more than we do currently. I think that's going to become much more about what we do. So that's the, the general direction that we are going in. <laughs> and then there's climate. So I'll finish on this. Just, there's a whole other story here, which is quite fun. But I will give you a little bit. So we do a lot of this, making lovely maps. So this was a, a colleague in Poland who was making a map of um, the solar energy available in Poland for solar radiation, um, uh, for uh, solar power. So this is a little study. But uh, the particular group that produced this data set, the Climate Monitoring and Satellite Applications System, the base in DMD, also produced another data set. So what they've done, they've taken the last uh, 30 years of our data. So we've, we've been watching over Europe and Africa and the Middle East and Brazil for 30, 30 long years. Now we've changed spacecraft and we've tweaked the images and we've changed the algorithm. So all of that has been reprocessed with a nice single algorithm to make it homogenous. And they've asked themselves a very, very important question. And that question is, where shall I go on a holiday? <laughs> so, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> so, what you can do, you can take that 30 day data set, and you can take a pixel of it, and you can say, right, I've got a 30 year record. How many days, so for every day of the year, how often is that day sunny? How often is that day, because you don't go on holiday for one day, how often is that day in a row of five sunny days in a row? So, Frankfurt. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, um, you're not coming to this region on holiday in November, are you? <laughs> Let's be honest. But come on, you know, May, May. We sometimes get lucky. May, August, sometimes. Yeah. And then, and then, well, let's go to La Palma. <laughs> On holiday, where you're looking at much, much higher probability. So you're looking at, you know, 80% probabilities of getting five sunny days in a row during the summer holidays, versus uh, less. <laughs> <laughs> so, so climate's another story, but there's a lot of this is now 
where there's much more innovation in our data. So the innovation on the side of um, the operational meteorology, so the day-to-day -day weather forecasting, is a lot to do with machines. So in my, in my trade, one of the struggles we're, we're having is how can you tell where thunderstorms will happen before there's a cloud in the sky? Because once there are clouds, we can see them, radar can see them, we can start telling them about them. But you actually want to be warned before there's a cloud in the sky. This is what we would call the breathing better environment. And that's one area where we want to concentrate on teaching machines so the algorithms to flag that up for the weather forecaster so that the weather forecasters and DVD or whoever can provide those kind of warnings. But the other area of innovation will be in that, because now we've got a 30 year time series. Is there information in there that is useful for things? So this is also useful for um, solar energy. You know, this isn't just going on holiday, it's, it's how much power can I get on my roof. Um, um, so there's a lot more work and innovation that can come out of the climate data. And originally, what we were doing with the climate data, I'll show pictures like that. <laughs> that, when you start to sort of talk about going on holiday and really landing it and conceptualizing it for people's real lives, starts to become much more interesting. This was picked up by the Spiegel. This was not. <laughs> <laughs> Can I talk about the hackathon really quickly? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay, so that's that's end of talk. The the hackathon is um, on June eleventh, um, and that's going to be huge fun. We are quite a conservative organisation, and you frighten us. So, so very slowly, we go. Okay, we'll feel, we'll feel. Um, because what we Because what we're about: data, spacecraft, out to operational weather services. But. It is becoming increasingly quite clear that there are a large number of people out there who can use our data and do amazingly creative and wonderful things with them that we've never thought of. And we really need to start opening ourselves up to um, new experiences and changing. So one of the things we've done in, in the house is we've finally got a uh, web map server and a couple of other APIs. Um, so we're joining the party relatively late, but there it is. There's a large European project we're involved in called Copernicus, which is about not just monitoring weather, but monitoring the entire Earth's environmental system. And one of the roles we have is getting hold of marine data. So information about sea surface temperature, about sea surface heights, which is related to how the oceans flow, and um, about ocean colour, which is related to how much chlorophyll and little bugs there are in the ocean that fish like to eat. Um, so we've got that data, and so the themes for the hackathon are going to be along the lines of, and this, this is quite a fun process. So we were talking, yeah, let's do a hackathon, yeah, let's do a cool hackathon. Data. You wanted to do one. We did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And he says, you know, what's the theme? And yeah. it's been a real, um, where are the actual avenues of opportunity, or where we can put interesting challenges out there for people to actually play with? So the challenges will be. Um, the first ones are to do with the actual data themselves. So if you take the um, ocean current data, the chlorophyll data, and the sea surface temperature data, can you build interesting and cool maps from them? Um, a couple of suggestions we've had from people who are interested in playing inside our house. One is if you take the sea surface temperature information, can you build a model of um, life expectancy if you fall off a ship? Or on <laughs> <laughs> Which is it's kind of interesting because then you can start to talk about how quickly you need to rescue somebody. <laughs> um, another one would be if you if you drop things into the ocean, where do they end up? Um, so uh, off the back of um, containers or you know, sort of the accidents near the ocean or or, or aircraft or things like that. Because actually, if you take some of the ocean current data that's derived from the sea surface height data, if you backtrace that, you can start to do sources of you know where might this have been spilt, whatever, um, that kind of thing. And the ocean colour is a lot to do with can you identify fishing nets, um, and so that directly connects to um, economic exploitation. The other two areas for challenge will be uh, one will be visualisation. 
So this data can be made to look really quite beautiful, but we want to get uh, beyond, ooh, that's cool, and somehow get from, ooh, that's cool and amazing, to I'm kind of engaged with it. So there's a continual theme in our data, which is to do with, um, yes, it's pretty, but it's also, in some sense, a mirror. The data we are getting is telling us something about how we, as people, are interacting with our environment. So can we somehow do some better visualizations that help people connect better to the world around them? Because those clouds, you know, images like that, well, they're nice, but somehow is that, how, what, what, what does it mean to me? And the third set of challenges will be around, how should we say, we've come to the party relatively late, um, we're getting there, we're getting better, but our, our APIs and our data access is not yet amazing. Um, so what we'd like is some people to A, break our APIs, come and break what we've given and give us feedback, or um, break it and build a little script that helps it more useful for somebody else. And in some sense, there'll be those of you who want to play at lowering the barrier of entry to these data for other people who can't quite get there. Um, so if some of you know R, can we get this stuff into R so that other people can start playing with these data in R without having to fight our data system, our um, data handling system. So it's kind of that, that sort of thing. So really lowering the barrier of entry to our data. So um, if you come along, it'll be amazing to see you. Um, I'm quite excited by the feedback we're going to get as an organisation. For us, this is a slow journey, but it is quite exciting to have people come and say, have you thought about doing this? I'm going, no, and we've got no idea how we're going to implement that. But what's noticeable in our internal conversations is we're starting to take this stuff seriously. Previously, we've gone, yeah, 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 but you know, that's not what our member states and the operational services need. Now we're starting to realize the um, strong legitimacy of a wider community, and it's starting to change us. So I'm really hoping to use the hackathon to change it.